Hello there and welcome. It's me, Martin Cross, and I'm with John Vojkovic today on Cross's Corner. Delighted to welcome you, John. Uh, just super thrilled to be here, Martin. Thank you so much for inviting me and, and really, really excited to talk about this topic. I'm just uh, a lot of gratitude that it's gotten so much attention. Yeah, you've had a lot of traction, haven't you, when that article came out on, on LinkedIn, Rowing a Zero Billion Dollar Industry. It's a great title for a, for a post. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, you know it it's a point that I think everybody in our community, uh, both domestically here in the United States and internationally, um, have you know we've all been asking the question, you know, this is such an amazing sport, amazing recreational activity that we do. Why is it so hard uh, to earn a living wage doing it? Right. And um, and it, it really got me thinking, uh, thinking on that. Well, I mean, I've been thinking about it for years as a professional coach. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, and I if I could tell a story real quick, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, you, that's you, right. So uh, a, about a year and a half ago, we had a big scandal here in the States um, around a, uh, there's a big controversy uh, around. Um, some very wealthy families uh, paying a college counselor to uh, get their kids um, uh, into high-level universities. And the way they were doing that was creating fake athletic profiles uh, and getting them in as athletic athletes, or, or excuse me, as, a, as a student athletes, recruited student athletes. And one of the more high-profile cases was, a, was an actress here in Los Angeles and her daughter, they were... Um, uh, they were uh, offering her as a, as a coxswain. As a, of course, she had nothing to do with rowing. She had no, but they created this whole profile and, and it was a big scandal. And, and um, I think the, the actress paid something like half a million dollars to do this. What? Yeah, I, it, was a, it was a really, really big Insane. deal. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I was, I was lamenting to my wife one day, you know, I said, God, there's just, there's no money in rowing. And, and she said, well, obviously that's not true somebody once paid half a million dollars just to pretend their kid rose. And, 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 and that really sent me on the direction of like, well, there's money out there, right? We're just not asking for it. Or we're not hitting, you know, the, the, the right points to engage that investment into the community. Um, and so then I, I really started to think, you know, okay, so how do we, if the money's out there, if people are, if people can drop half a million dollars just to pretend their kid rows, what would they be willing to pay if their kid was actually rowing? Um, and that sort of got the, the genesis of the article and what uh, really made me uh, uh, think about laying it out. Yeah. Uh, we, we, sh we should sort of say people um, will obviously know from the way you talk, John, that, uh, you know, you have spent a lifetime in the sport, but maybe maybe just a brief resume. Yeah, um, sure. Um, so I've been coaching for uh, working in the rowing community one way or another, coaching and, and leading teams and organizations for over 25 years. Um, I started um, in New England, Boston, um, at a Boston University. Um, I was a student athlete there. Um, actually started sculling before that at a little club in Providence, Rhode Island called Narragansett Boat Club. Fantastic club. Great, great culture there. Um, graduated immediately, got into coaching, um, coached at a, at a small university in, in Worcester called uh, Clark University. Um, and uh, from, you know, just went on from there, went back to Boston University to coach for a number of years. Um, you know, my wife's work led us out to Los Angeles, uh, coached junior athletes in Los Angeles, went back to Boston, uh, coached uh, again for another couple of years uh, with Boston University, University of Rhode Island, um, back to the West Coast, and uh, uh, coached uh, to division head coach at a Division One school in the Bay Area called Santa Clara. Um, and then... Um, uh, and then, you know, there's a few coaching gigs, smaller ones here and there, but uh, leading us back to Los Angeles. And I'm the uh, boys varsity coach at the uh, University of California, Los Angeles uh, junior rowing team. Yeah. And I know so, you're, you're currently on furlough there, but you've you've got this consultancy that you, yeah. you've kind of this growing consultancy, which 
kind of taps you into a lot of different sort of views and opinions and, and people. Yeah. Yeah. So I started, uh, I mean, I was doing this um, ad hoc for a number of years, just here and there, helping people out with different projects within their rowing clubs. I was doing some coach recruiting, um, you know, finding coaches for organizations and, and filling open headcount. And uh, again, my, my wife and her infinite genius uh, said, you know, why don't you make this into a company? And uh, and I thought, well, that's that's great. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of coaches out there that um, are leveraging their, their experience and their skill set into online coaching. And I and, and I looked at that and I thought, well, that's a great that's a great model. But I also realized that no one is really working with directly with the organizations and um, uh, you know, there's again, we, we we work in an outstanding community full of some really, really brilliant people, um, well-educated, very, very strategic, very, uh, very thoughtful people. Um, but not everybody knows everything all the time. And um, I frequently come across um, a clubs that are challenged in one way or another, um, strategically and tactically. You know, um, how do we plan? five, 10, 15, 20 years budgetarily, uh, you know, or, or you know, um, uh, one project I recently did was mapping out uh, the uh, depreciation schedule for equipment, like, okay, what should our, uh, turno- what should our turnover schedule be? Yeah. Um, and so, um, so yeah, it, it, it's been, uh, it's, it's really, um, it's a really fun way to spend yeah. some time working with all these different rowing clubs and and seeing their challenges, but also seeing how well they work, you know, and, and, and it, it's been a great um, cauldron for good ideas, wow. right? Um, and so I, I feel like I'm at the nexus of a, a lot of really, really terrific things and, and also seeing where the challenges are. Yeah. Um, some people are going to go um, ask questions. I mean, uh, Sometimes it's, it's always a bit of a juggle. It does the question, you know, ask a question if someone, Phil Lubacic, is listening to this. Um, so before we actually get into your article, he's, he's asked this question. Uh, I don't know if you've thought about it or not. Uh, I haven't. I mean, we do we do have that track record. Um, it may be uh, over 100 years old at this point, but the last time we went down that route, it, uh, it kind of wrecked the professional level of rowing, right? Um, you know, if people that are uninformed or unaware, you know, I, I, back in the day, rowing used to be a huge sport and then there was so much betting and gambling around it that it kind of fell apart. There was so much corruption around it. Um, I, you know, I, I'm going to waffle a little bit on that answer. I, I haven't really thought about it. Um, I think, you know, obviously there's sports betting that occurs in a lot of other uh, sports to a successful degree. Um, you know, I, I, without getting too political, I think when you invite things like that, you invite more, uh, government intervention and regulation. And I, I think that that's not always the best thing. Um, uh, you certainly don't want to bring more scrutiny into, to what you're doing. Um, and, uh, so I, I, I don't know. I think maybe there's better ways to earn money in rowing than simply yeah. from the gambling. Well, I mean. Let, let's talk about th- this article, which has, has got all this traction that, that you've written. Um, and I, I think in part it was because there were some controversial elements to it in as much as you were looking at our sport, um, which uh, is an amateur sport. And you were saying that it's the amateurism that keeps our sport, you know, um, so poor. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, I, I sort of, intentionally put that in there to, 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 to draw attention, um, to it. I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, one of the things that we've held up as the standard within our community is the, uh, this idea that we're, we're amateurs, you know, and I think that sort of dovetails neatly with the ideal of, uh, Olympic amateurs, right? Um, yeah. now we know, we all know that that's, you know, the idea of the Olympic amateur is, is pretty far gone at this point, um, except for rowing, (laughs) um, you know, so, so, so yeah, I, I, it wasn't meant, it was meant to be critical to, 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 to get the reader's attention. Um, I don't think we necessarily need to, to sacrifice all of our traditions, 
But I think really the, the, the point of it was, hey, we can be so intractably tied to our traditions, which are like an amazing, wonderful thing. But it's those traditions that keep people out. Because when you bring somebody new into an activity and then you sort of pile on these things, well, you do it this way and that way, and you can't do it this, you know, this way. Um, I think those things can become uh, very, very burdensome to somebody that's, that's relatively new to the sport. You know, one club I used to coach at, this is many, many years ago, but in order to qualify to take out a club single, you had to do a standing shove from the dock. And yeah, you know, and that's that's certainly possible to do in a yeah. sense, but it's a very refined skill. So as an instructor following the rules, I mean, it's extraordinarily difficult to teach a septuagenarian to do a standing shove in a single. It can be done, yeah. but somebody that's a novice, I mean, you can obviously imagine some of the challenges around that. Um, but that's the idea is that, you know, we have these so many of these amateur traditions um, <clears throat> that it sort of precludes somebody early on getting into the sport with an active interest and not necessarily being frustrated by by all these rules and i think the second part of that of course is we have to be able to let go of the amateurism so that it's okay for someone to start monetizing what we're doing within the community i think there's tolerance for coaches that want to coach on the side. But I think as soon as somebody says, you know, what if we were to, you know, change things a little bit, really think about how to monetize this. And dare I say, what if we were to raise dues? What if we were to charge more to be part of the club? Um, and that's where, that's where things get really, really controversial. And, uh, and, and, and people, you know, they start to push back and say, well, we don't, you know, why do we need to raise dues? Everything's fine. Um, well, because you want professional coaches, you want quality equipment, you want your facility to be maintained. Um, and I think, I, I, you know, I, I think amateurism sort of implies that the boat bay has to have rodent droppings all over it. There have to be old T-shirts, and um, and the more we can move away from that, the better. Yeah. Um, Steve O'Connor, uh, welcome, Steve. Thanks for listening. Um, uh, he's asked a couple of questions. There are two here from Steve. He's, he's, he's just put one up now. Mm -hmm. um, but there's that question about the, 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 the clubs and uh, this question, um, which I guess would be dear to his heart. Do you want to deal with, with maybe both of those um so welcome everyone that's tuned in and listening and thanks for your questions uh, we'll we'll try and get through as many of them as we can but how about that john okay so are there good examples of clubs in the us that are financially secure yeah absolutely um you know i can highlight uh one club in uh in in um connecticut uh a state in the, uh, in the united states uh, saga talk rowing club is a for profit rowing club um that is doing you know the, I, I, it's a private club so i don't know yeah. what the financials are uh but they've been running that club for i got i imagine over 10 years now 10 15 years um and not only that um the owner of that club has created a model where they've actually um created the aro america brand um where they started two other clubs on top of that also for profit um, and they're doing very well. Sagatuck, uh, on the youth side, uh, their women have won, I think it's something like four or five national championships in, in a row at the club level. Um, and they're sending their athletes to top tier American universities uh, to, 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 to row and compete. Um, but yeah, I, I, when you look at the nonprofit area, then yeah, there's also some very, very wealthy clubs that are, uh, that are very, very successful. Um, you know, particularly on the West Coast, uh, you have uh, clubs like Marin, Oakland yeah. Strokes. Um, you know, our own club at UCLA is, uh, you know, is is uh, financially solvent. You know, we function in the black every year. Um, in fact, our, you know, I'll say our the recreation department at UCLA that sponsors us, they're very happy every year with, you know, the slight, uh, you know, the slight black ink, the slight amount of black ink 
um, that we that we have. Um, so I think if you know if you look at the large clubs um, across the United States, there's a, a, there's a very very good model um, for uh, for for growth and financial support. And I want to make sure I want to make it clear that these clubs have very strong fundraising arms, but they operate in the black because they're charging an appropriate amount amount to make sure that they're you know, that they're meeting their budget. Um, and that's really the key thing. I think a lot of clubs, you know, they, they still are undercharging. Uh, yeah. Um, th th there's, uh, th there's a few questions here. Steve O'Connor says in, in terms of clubs understanding, I, I think mm -hmm. Philip Bacic has, uh, you know, in, ter in terms of blame, is this to do with the way clubs are run? Is this the fact they're run by amateurs rather than professionals? And and Rory Crookshank asked, mm -hmm. do you think club annual fees are the the key, or or should prize money be more important? And a lot of other. Well, where do so, I start? <laughs> yeah, how about uh, this one then? Uh, how well do you think cl uh, clubs truly understand the cost of running a boat club? Well, I think it varies from club to club based on the conversations that I've had in the past. You know, there are some clubs that um, that, that 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 get it, I guess. Um, and I think you know, one club I can think of that I work with that have actually have a tiered uh, system of dues. So if you're younger, just out of college, you pay less than somebody who's more senior and, and uh, ostensibly has more income. Um, uh, I've also seen some clubs that uh, haven't raised their dues in 20 years um, and they have a facility that they're trying to uh, maintain. Um, they're trying to buy new equipment and they don't understand why there's so much red ink in the budget. And, and, you know, I have to say, well, you know, you're charging, you know, I, I did a post about this yesterday, actually. Um, I mean, affl inflation is a thing, right? You know, and so if you haven't raised your, dues in 20 years um that may be well and good for the people that have been there for the last 20 years but you know the roof is falling off the plumbing doesn't work you have to pay the you know you have to pay the uh, electric bill um that that's very very challenging um so i i do think that there are some clubs where the board of directors um can be somewhat intractable um, and, you know, and, and for some reason, when the, the conversation about dues comes up, everybody gets really, really emotional, you know, and um, and, I, and I have to always wonder why it's, you know, obviously, OK, no one wants to pay more money. Right. Um, you know, but I, I'm going to call I'm going to call the bluff on that a little bit, because, again, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've seen people leave rowing because of time commitment, because of family commitment, academic commitment. I've never seen anybody say that is too much money. I quit. And um, and maybe I, you know, my experience is is, is limited on, on this. I'll certainly be willing to hear uh, alternate ideas. But you know, and this is a this is another point when you look at other recreational clubs. You know, golf clubs, um, football clubs, and you look at what they're charging for ostensibly an outstanding athletic recreational experience versus what rowing clubs are charging. We're not less valuable and experience being out in the water than golf being out on the course. But why do we charge, you know, 10% less or not 10%, 10% 10 of what a country club charges. Yeah. That to me just boggles my mind. And, uh, you know, it's not a less valuable experience. So in order to come back around to the, to the original question, um, I think by and large, it's not that they don't understand the cost of running the club, but I think they've been getting, a lot of people have been getting a really, really sweet deal for, you know, 60, 70 years, and, uh, and they don't want to change it. They don't want to change it.